He keeps saying, he sat down to teach. The crowds had to stand up around him because they didn't have chairs. Well, the older I got, the more I saw the benefits of sitting to teach. So, I'm trying to cover a number of basic topics in Christian faith so that we'll understand the stuff that makes for the heart of it, the meat of it. And I want to talk today uh, about sin. So I'm going to start with the Ten Commandments. You may remember that the Israelites were slaves in Egypt and God heard and sympathized and cared about them and sent Moses to lead them out of slavery and brought them to the mountain where Moses had seen the burning bush. And there God taught them and among other things gave them these commandments. This is Exodus 20, verses 1 through 17. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. I'm going to do the New Testament passage in about the middle of the sermon after I've made some points. So, there we are, the classic Ten Commandments, don't do this, don't do this, and a couple of do this and do that. Um, and when we break those things, when we don't do what it says, when we don't keep others of the commandments, the Jewish rabbis tell us that there's 624 commandments in the Old Testament then we, we say, that's sin. We've done what was wrong. But I want to try to get down to a little bit of a deeper level. Jesus gives some examples in his own preaching of trying to get to a deeper level than the Old Testament laws. I want to try to get there today, especially because I think that we misunderstand what sin is. And I'm sure that people outside the church misunderstand what we mean by sin, because uh, I've listened to them and, and heard them. There's a marketing technique that's used all over the place in the modern world, and that is you try to arouse a desire for something, even if it's something people never thought they wanted very much, and then having aroused that desire, you try to sell them something to meet the desire. You know? Here. Here's a car. It won't just take you here and there. It's beautiful. It's fast. It's extraordinary. Don't you want it? We're selling it. Or, here's a beer that's such a good beer that you'll get the girls if you drink this beer. <laughs> it ain't true, but uh, the advertisements, watch the beer advertisements, it sure looks like that's what they mean. Maybe, you know, when you can't get the girls, you've still got this desire that's been roused up, so buy our beer. A lot of advertising works like that. Stimulate a desire, even if it's new or different than anything anybody ever wanted before, and then sell them something for it. And sometimes people outside the church 
think and complain that that's what we're doing in here. You're bad, you're sinful, you're broken, you're messed up, you need what we've got to sell. We're selling Jesus. I hope not. Last time Jesus was for sale, somebody paid 30 pieces of silver for him. And I hope we don't think that we're doing that again. But from outside the church, it sometimes looks to people like that's what we're doing. We're telling people that they're bad so that they think that they need what we have in order to be good again. And, and what people ought to do instead is to tell one another that they're good, that they're wonderful, that they're worthwhile, that everybody's accepted no matter what. And that is a part of the Christian message too. But we do insist on this thing about sin. I just think we misunderstand it. So I want to try to understand it. There's a sermon that I've given three times in my life, four times in the last 20 years. 20 years? Oh, Lord, yes. All right, I'd forgotten how long it had been. And I need to review part of that sermon for you in order to give you an idea of what I'm working on. And in this sermon, what I do is I say, hey, we're Christians, we believe that everybody sins, so I'm going to ask everybody if you think, if you agree that you yourself have been sinful, but, but, I'm going to do some qualifications. I'm going to say, we're not going to count certain things as sin in order to clarify, in order to get through the forest and see the trees, maybe. So I say, Look, if you've broken the law, or you think of law-breaking, or the public law-breaking, or rules in your society, or, or the government around you, if you've done that, we're not going to count it as sin this morning. We're not going to count that as sin this morning. And if you've broken the laws of God, or the Ten Commandments, or any of the other commandments in the Bible, that, that's religious laws. They come from outside. Yeah, we say they come from God, but, but just for today... I say, we're not going to count those as sin. We're not going to count that stuff from the outside. And, and your parents tell you to do things. And your spouse tells you to do things. And your friends and family tell you to do things. And sometimes you do them, and sometimes you don't. But that's stuff that other people tell you. And I don't want to count that as sin right now. Because we're trying to look at what's at the heart of sin. And that comes from the outside. And sometimes we do things that we know are wrong or bad, but we feel like we couldn't help it. We were trapped. It was a situation maybe where there were no good choices. Or it was a situation where we had to do something that we knew was partly wrong because we couldn't find anything that was entirely right to do. We feel trapped. Or we feel trapped by our own character or our own lack of opportunity. So... For right now, we're not going to count that as sin. If we were trapped, if we couldn't help it, we're not going to count that. Or sometimes we do stuff that we think was all right, that it was okay, until later. And then later we change our minds and we see the effects of it and know that it hurt someone. Or we change our minds about what's good and what's bad and we realize that what we did was wrong in the past. But at the time, we didn't think it was so bad. So since that involves that change, that change of perspective, we're not going to count that either for right now. It doesn't count. It's not sin. Not, not, not for right now. Or sometimes we do stuff that we know is mean or nasty or selfish or rude, but we don't really worry about it because we do it to someone we don't care about, someone we don't hardly know, strangers or mere acquaintances. We don't really think we've done something bad when we cuss out the guy who pulls in front of us on the highway. We don't really think we've done something bad when we sell goods that are no better than anyone else's goods, but we pressure them and we talk them up and we lie a little to make them sound better than they are because we're selling them to strangers and they do the same to us, don't they, in order to make their money? Sometimes we do stuff that we sort of know is wrong, but we don't really care about it because... We're doing it to people that we don't hardly know, and we don't care about that much. For right now, we're not going to call that sin. We're going to lay that aside, too. So what I do when I preach this sermon is I say, hey, when we put all that stuff aside, 
everything left over. Now I'm going to ask you if you think that you've been sinful. So what's left? What's left? And the answer is that the only thing left is if you've done something that you yourself thought was wrong. And you thought it was wrong right at the time you did it. Not afterwards. Not in a different way. And you did it not to some stranger, but to someone that you love. To someone that you love. And that you would have said, hey, I'll do anything in the world not to hurt this person I love. And yet there you were. You chose to do it. You knew it was wrong. You knew it was wrong when you did it. That's what we're going to count as sin for this morning. That's all we're going to count. And when I do this in this sermon, and, and once I did it for a congregation of more than 300 people, um, and I've done it three other times. I did it once here, and I'm going to go on and do different stuff with it afterwards. That's why this is a new sermon. But I did it once here three years ago. And I leave everybody to think about it. I give them two or three whole minutes, which feels like forever when you're sitting there in silence. And then I say, okay, everyone who agrees that by this standard, I am sinful, stand up. I've never had less than 99.5% of all the people listening stand up. Almost everybody knows and remembers times that they've hurt someone they love, and not by accident, but because they deliberately did something selfish, or unkind, or whatever. And they knew better, and they could have done differently, but for whatever reason, they did it anyway. Maybe young children don't. They don't understand it. But everyone who's lived long enough knows that we sometimes do stuff like this. I've never had less than 99.5% of all people stand up. And I've had non-Christians stand up and come and tell me afterwards, look, I, I finally understand about that. I still don't believe your religion, but at least now I understand what you're talking about. What I'm talking about is the nature of sin. Not just the character of it, not just the way it looks from the outside. From the outside, it looks like law-breaking. From the outside, it looks like rule-breaking. From the outside, it looks like hurting other people. But from the inside, what it looks like is that we're broken. From the inside, what it looks like is that we're broken. Not completely, not totally spoiled, not, not utterly and irredeemably wicked, but broken enough that sometimes we can't help but do bad stuff, even when we don't want to. I want to read from Paul's epistle to the Romans now in the 7th chapter, verses 15 through 20. In Romans, Paul starts with two and a half whole chapters talking about what's wrong and what's bad and what's awful and how terrible people have been, and then he talks about how God is going to rescue us from that. And then when he starts talking about how God is going to rescue us from that, he talks about what it is inside us that makes us need that rescue. And he says this, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but the sin, the brokenness, that dwells within me. This too is the word of the Lord. So I, I want to talk about this brokenness and how it produces the things we ordinarily call sins. And the brokenness, we say as Christians, comes from our broken relationship to God. And it creates a kind of a trappedness where we're no longer competent 
to be human beings. We no longer have all the power of will and goodness that we need to be good human beings. It looks like being human is so hard, so difficult, that only God can do it right. There are all kinds of examples of this. Uh, let me use, for one thing, alcoholics as an example. Alcoholics are people who've done enough drinking that there's been a biochemical change in the way their brain works and in the way their liver works and other things work. So that now they're trapped. They can't help themselves. They can't not drink. But even if you have the genetic predisposition to that, if you never ever drank anything in your whole life, you'd never have triggered that biochemical change. Those original choices have become a trap. And that feeling of being trapped and unable to do what you really want and unable to stop from doing what you don't want, that's an image of what all of sin is like. But it's not just things that we would call addictions that are like this. There are other behaviors that are like this. Now, I want to lay aside the case of men who are physically violent with their wives or their children. It's too extreme an example. I'm going to put that one aside. But there are lots of men, fathers and husbands, who we would think are pretty good guys, reasonably good people, but have a terrible problem with anger. And even if they don't hit anybody, they yell, they scream, they say nasty things, they insult even the people they love, their wives and children. And the ones who don't justify themselves saying, no, I'm right, I'm good, I'm just trying to make them be good, those tend to get violent. The ones who don't do that hate themselves for doing it. Are upset at themselves. Are sorry about it. And sometimes they even apologize and apologize a lot, but they can't seem to stop. There's some inner, I'm right and they're wrong and therefore they should do what I say. That basic, I'm right, I'm right, rather than God is right, that keeps them from being able to change. And lying, everybody lies. Everybody lies. And worst of all, we don't just lie when we're selling cars and perfume. We don't just lie when we're trying to get a good job. We don't just lie when... The lawyers are asking us stuff. We lie to our friends and our family because we're afraid they won't like us or because we want to cover up something stupid we did or because we're being selfish and we want to get something we want and have to, have to get our friends and family to let us have it so we try to make excuses or reasons or whatever. We don't do what we think is right and necessary. Sometimes we're lazy. We don't work as hard as we should at what needs to be done. And we make excuses and then we goof off and selfishly do whatever we want for ourselves instead of doing what needs to be done. And regret it too. And feel bad about it. But can't stop it. I've heard some teenage boys tell me about what it was like to spend four hours a day every day for four years in high school playing video games. And knowing that, hey, it's a fun game and it'd be all right if I played it five or six hours a week, but just this constant binge playing or binge watching TV, even if it's good stuff, doing that much of it isn't good. We're human beings. We're capable of such an incredible variety of different things to do. There's something broken inside of us. And what Christian faith teaches is that the real nature of sin is that brokenness. And the brokenness is a broken relationship between us and God. At some point we decided, hey, I'm right and God is wrong about this. I know what will make me happy. I know what's the right thing to do. Some of God's commandments are silly. Others of them are perfectly good and I agree with them, but some of them are silly. And I know better than God does about this stuff. And if we said it out loud, we say, okay, that's silly. But in our hearts, that's what we believe. I know what I want and what's good for me. And if God says different, then God's wrong about this. 
We have a broken relationship with God, and that breaks our relationship with everything else. That breaks our relationship with everything else, and especially with other people. Without God to bind us together, we tend to break ourselves up into separate groups. Me and my family, we're right. Everybody else is wrong. Me and my group, us white men, they're trying to steal our heritage here in this country. Me and my ancestors, we made this country very great, and these other people are trying to steal it. Or look at the way people have hated the Jews, and the way the Jews hate the Arabs, and the way that the Turkish hate the Armenians, and the way that the Americans treated the American Indians. You don't have to look very far to see us as human beings broken up into at least a couple of hundred different groups who hate at least some of the other groups all. Our relationships with one another are broken, and they're broken because our relationship with God is broken. And that brokenness produces breaking commandments. That brokenness produces breaking the law. That brokenness produces lying and cheating and stealing, produces selfishness and rapacious business practices and tax cuts that give more money to the people who've already got money and sending 15,000 soldiers to the border to keep 7,000 women and children out? I mean, is that silly? 15,000 armed soldiers against 7,000 people, two-thirds of whom are women and children? I'm sorry, even military intelligence is telling us right now that that's who's mostly in that caravan, and most of them will never make it here anyway. It's that brokenness inside that starts with not believing that God is really going to do good for us and that we have to take care of ourselves <coughs> selfishly if we're ever to get anything good out of this life that produces all of the other stuff that we call sin. That brokenness with God also is understood even by people of other religions, so let me call it something different. The Taoists say, look, if you're out of harmony with the Tao, with the way, with the way of the universe, the balance, then you're going to be screwed up. You're going to screw up the life of others. The, the Buddhists say, look, there's a way, an eightfold path, to escape your separation from everything else. And that separation from everything else is what gives you a feeling that you're an individual who's suffering in a world that's full of pain and sorrow. What you need is to rejoin the whole. That's nirvana. Again, it's a broken relationship that's understood. Even the Muslims understand that. If you're not willing to accept the will of God, then your relationship with Him is broken. And you won't receive mercy. God won't take care of you. Even many atheists understand this, although they understand it in terms of our relationship to the whole, to the entirety of the human race, or even our relationship to our whole lives. We tend to think of ourselves as though we exist just right now. But we don't. We have a past and a future. Even if there's no God, even if there's no other world, even if there's no spiritual realm, there is us with a real past and a real future. And sometimes our relationship, even to ourselves, is broken. We're doing what we want right now, even though it's going to damage our future. So even atheists frequently understand that when we're out of sympathy, out of balance, out of harmony, with the whole of what everything is and the whole of human life and the whole of the human race, then that broken relationship is going to produce sorrow, suffering, wickedness, selfishness, lying, cheating, war, murder. This is the real stuff that we're talking about in Christianity when we talk about sin. It's stuff that we're not the only ones who know and agree that there's something wrong here. That there's something wrong with us that needs to be fixed. I'm going to talk next week about where this comes from and how it's caused.
But right now, what I want us to learn is what its character and nature is. That brokenness. Amen. Turn off the thing. Andrew? And that button.